What up, everybody? It's Hollywood Unlocked and Censored. I'm Jason Lee. Hey, it's DJ Damis. Let's get it started. Okay, now we have a real celebrity in the building today. She's a Grammy right. winner and an Emmy winner and one of the funniest people that I've ever seen anywhere in life, Kathy Griffin. Yes. I'm a huge fan. And, and I, I want to tell people how this even happened. It's not like I bumped into you at Gelson's. I called <laughs> Tiffany Haddish. Me and Tiffany are sitting on the phone shooting the shit. I don't even know. Out of nowhere, I just said, you know who I really want to talk to? She's like, who? And I'm like, Kathy Griffin. And she's <laughs> like, well, I could just call her for you. And, I, and I'm like, really? And I've always loved your fearlessness, um, your advocacy for, our com for my community, not damages. Um, your, um, you know, your comedy is so unfiltered and so perfect that mm -hmm. I've, I've always been a fan of you. Uh, and then, of course, you know, when you took on the Cheeto in charge, I'm like, well, shit, she has balls that nobody else has. And I just fell in love with you even more. So I was glad that you agreed to come to this raggedy ass show. Welcome. Oh, my God. Thank you. I, I'm, um, I try to get a little more filtered every day and every day I fail. So uh, it's my honor. It's my pleasure. And um, I actually uh, got a great compliment from somebody who uh, works with the works, works with 45, the occupant, whatever you want to call the Cheeto in charge. And she said, um, I love you so much because you scared the shit out of him. And <laughs> his name is Congresswoman Maxine Waters. So hey. uh, if I've just done nothing but scare him for a while, then it was worth it. Listen, you, uh, wait, oh, Auntie wait. Maxine was here on the show. And what I love about her, I had to honor her too, because I felt like when the impeachment became a part of popular culture and everybody wanted to talk about it because the popular culture was talking about it, I'm like, yo, she was calling for his impeachment from the beginning. And I felt like people discredited her because uh, she's a black woman. And I felt like people, you know, you're a comic and many, much more than that, but you bring light to unfortunate situations and create conversations to make us think. So I just felt like because you both are women, you've been easy targets. Oh, I, I agree. And thanks for the compliment. I'm glad to even be in her, her company. And I was so glad to have the opportunity to talk to her recently via Zoom. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's ageism in there as well as the sexism and the racism stuff. But I'm just such a fan of hers and representing her constituents the way she does. And I'm sure you guys have seen the video of when she saw a guy getting pulled over and she just got out of the car and talked to the policeman herself and stuff. So, you know, those are the kind of representatives we want and we need. And she's carrying on in the great tradition of all the great Democrats. So what we're going through now is this all this like online BS and people believing all these crazy conspiracy theories. I It's pained me to watch her get thrown into this group of people where they make up stuff about her, they denigrate her, they try to take her down. So I respect her so much. And I, you know, I love any, um, any elected official, of course, that has a sense of humor. So when she was nice enough to give me that compliment, it meant so much because I know she's seen everything. And I love that she's just not stopping and she doesn't let them deter her. So she, she's a great elected official and she'll always be remem remembered as that. And she's also not dumb, which I also Love. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to, and I wanted y'all to have that moment, um, talking about you being unfiltered. Were you always that way growing up? When did that come about? Was that something that was always a part of your personality? Yes, I've always been like this. It's an incurable condition. And I was just that kid, you know, that got in trouble all through school. I went to a Catholic school. The mm. nuns always complained about me. They would always like, we had old fashioned report cards in those days and they'd write, you know, um, she's too boy crazy and always trying to make people laugh you know, or, or would do better if she applied herself. And I was like, I'm applying myself to being funny and getting in trouble. So um, I was definitely the black sheep of my family, proudly so, the class clown, proudly so. And I want to give those people a, a shout out too. If you're the class clown, that's a good thing. All right. You know, a lot of smart people are funny as well. And if you're getting in trouble, there's such a thing. And I'm sure, you know, Congressman, uh, the legendary John Lewis's great phrase, good trouble. So I think it's good that we keep reminding people that there is such a thing as good trouble in this cancel culture. So, uh, yeah, I think um, now more than ever, I, I do feel it's my responsibility as a comic. And if you feel like you're a truth teller or you've got something to say, if you're shining the light on something and it's true, then you have to go for it because now we're living in this place where people are fearful and they're too careful. And, you know, I'm somebody that's a living example. I've gotten in a lot of trouble and I've rebounded sometimes. Yes, sometimes no, but you know, I just can't help myself. So whatever it is that's wrong with me, it's getting worse. Listen, I I've been really big on saying fuck cancel culture. I think it's like the cancer of our world right now besides, well, Besides 45, besides COVID-19, that 45 let run amok. But I just feel like cancel culture is so out of control. 
You know, I love, I own Hollywood Unlocked. I own my radio show. I, I am afraid to audition for people and work for anybody because I know I'm going to always say shit that's going to piss somebody off. And I want to be able to say, fuck you if I do it. And I feel like I get, I get that there needs to be like the Harvey Weinsteins of the world who need yeah. to be taken down. But there was all the people that knew about Harvey Weinstein. There was yeah. all the people that supported Harvey Weinstein. Car cancel culture, when it happened to you with that mask, I'm like, wait a minute. This is a man who said, grab women by the pussy. This is a man who's denigrated uh, gold star families. This is a man who's allowed race mongering to be a problem in our country. This is a man who allows kids in cages. This is a man who hundreds of thousands of people now have died in our country because of COVID. And he knew about it, but didn't want people to panic. What does, why, why? Interesting. And this is, um, this is probably, you probably have, you probably have thought about this millions of times, but I'm going to say it as if I don't, because I really don't know. Why in the fuck does holding a mask of the man that's responsible for all that in, in, a, in, in humor Cancel you, but he still gets to decide whether or not we blow up Israel. It was such BS. The whole thing was BS. Now knowing what I know, that there was this whole online campaign that they paid for to take my photo, once again, holding up a Halloween mask with ketchup on it. To, was it an extreme image? Yes. Was there a video where I made fun of going, oh my God, I'm going to have to you know, go live in another country? Yeah. Because I practically did, you know, but I've known this fool for decades. I met him in 1996 when he was a guest star on this sitcom I was on in the 90s called Suddenly Susan. I've run into him at every charity event in New York you can imagine. I've had to be seated next to him for four hours one time at like a celebrity roast. I mean, I know this fool. And, you know, I, I didn't know he was like, I didn't know the race stuff. And I didn't, I, but I, everybody knows he's a corrupt criminal and all this everything, you know. And so, you know, I felt really strongly as, as a comedian and all the comedians that went before me, the great Joan Rivers and the great George Carlin and the great Richard Pryor, the ones that really set the bar for what you want to do as a comic, none of them were afraid. I mean, you know, they all made statements at a time when maybe other people were doing jokes. And I don't know, I'm, I'm going to be 60 years old in November. You know, what do I freaking care anymore at this point? I've done a lot of stuff in comedy and I'm going to continue to do comedy. But I'll be honest, you know, you live long enough and you have these moments where you go, you know what, now it's time to make a statement. And that fool is such an idiot. If I could tell you some of the conversations I've had with him, you wouldn't even believe it. He's such an idiot. And he's aggressively stupid. I mean, when this guy says he read the Bob book, <laughs> well, please, he can't read a Dick and Jane book. But the stuff he believes is so, it's embarrassing. So I thought, if you're going to go for the king, you got to cut his head off. And by the way, that kind of imagery is certainly not new to comedy. I mean, there's a movie called Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag. There's yeah. scenes in the film Death Becomes Her with Meryl Streep where they talk about that. There's Perseus and Medusa, which I didn't know. But as I talk about in my film, Kathy Griffin held a story, which I made about the whole thing. You know, um, Hillary Clinton mentioned it. She commented on my scandal and she said, oh, I thought she was doing a spoof of Perseus and Medusa, which I never heard of, but let's go with it. And um, I really appreciate you saying that you, you like to work for yourself because not everyone can, let's be honest. But one of the things that I believe really strongly in is, um, you know, if you can work for yourself and if you can set up a situation where environmentally or financially or spiritually, whatever you want to call it, artistically, if you can do the stuff you want to do and you know is good and it's solid and you can stand by it, man, I would encourage everyone to do that. You know, and by the way, we all work for people. We all do. I have my own business, but I answer to the fans. I answer to, you know, my own bank account. I'm my own investor and stuff like that. But I just felt like at, you know, a time when I knew this guy was really, really bad. And I knew that people didn't know quite how bad he could be, at least not white people. I thought, I got to say something about this guy. And, you know, I, I the cancellation was so extreme. I didn't know the campaign was behind it. Can, can I tell I you, can I tell you, can I tell you, can I tell you when I saw them talk about it on The View, <laughs> and I love and I love and I love Whoopi Goldberg. I've met Whoopi. I've been to the View. I love them and I love that show. It's one of my favorite shows. Yeah. But watching them talk about it and not get it, you know, not get yeah. what was happening because I'll be honest with you until I saw your YouTube post uh that 17 minute YouTube post which by the way <laughs> you talk shit so perfectly that I want to grow up and be like you. When you laid everybody out in that video. Receipt 
receipts. 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 I think what people, so if you're watching this show or you're listening, wherever the fuck you are, go to YouTube, pause this shit, come back because I need the clicks, but go watch a hell of a story on her page. There's over a million views. You are laying it out. And I think what people don't really realize is behind the scenes of a lot of this shit, there's other strings happening. Mm -hmm. I've been very vocal about Harvey Levin being the Harvey Weinstein of the pop culture. He is a culture rapist. I am not a fan of his. We broke a story yesterday about Cardi being off taking a divorce. He tried to take it as an exclusive. He does it all the time. And to watch your video, I, I want people to really look at that through those lenses. Look at what's happened to you through those lenses because I don't think people understand like there's so much more going on behind what mm -hmm. you see. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning Harvey Levin because I think he's I think he's just awful. And you know, he gets away with it under the guise of like he puts himself on camera why I don't know and he's like drinking a slurpee or whatever that is. And you know, now Warner Brothers bought TMZ, so I guess he feels he's not responsible, but you know, he's really in bed with Donald Trump. I mean, and I lay, I do lay it out in that video and I lay it out in my film, but I always say to people, consider the source. You know, I used to look at TMZ because I would say it was a fun, guilty pleasure blog and stuff. No, not when you're in bed with the Oval and the White House. I mean, that's bizarre, you know? And um, I think he shows people of color more often in trouble, DUIs, getting in fights and anything else. Um, he's, in my opinion, extremely ageist. I mean, whenever he shows a woman over 30, it's like cellulite and you know, what was she thinking? That sort of thing. So, you know, it, he's really um, decided to get uh, almost become a political operative, frankly, because he's had years of just convincing of, oh, it's just a fun Hollywood gossip blog. So when he went after me and, you know, he uh, supposedly has a vault that everyone in Hollywood is afraid of. I don't give a crap about his vault. Open your vault, you know, <laughs> and I don't know why people are so afraid of with their vaults, but you know, it is important that people know kind of where these folks are coming from. And let me tell you something. If people knew how much Harvey Levin makes off peddling the, you know, dirty secrets and getting phone calls, certain celebrities call him and they have relationships with him. You know, I've never done that. I, I would never want to do that. I've never sold a story, anything like that. So when folks like that try to paint me in that with that brush or anybody else, I just I sort of take pleasure in just saying, uh, OK, you know, before you enjoy it too much as a guilty pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, just go back and do like a five minute Google search and stuff. So I uh, I certainly had people in the industry say I shouldn't have made that YouTube video. But, you know, <laughs> it's got no, a lot no, but, be, be, but of da damage yeah, when we're done with this interview. <laughs> Before we go to iHeart, you have to watch this 17 minute clip. She starts by reading out his, she starts by playing his message and reading out his phone number and then tells everybody, which I thought was brilliant, make sure you screen record this shit in case they take it down and just share it wherever. The yeah. shit was funny, but you didn't just go after him. You know, in my head, I always said three people that I wanted to be friends with Kelly Ripa. Uh, 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 Anderson Cooper and fucking Andy Cohen. Now I have to take Andy's off to the side now because mm. he's, I didn't know he was meddling, you know, and I know my community, we could be messy queens behind the scene, but I didn't know that Andy Cohen was that messy. Messy, messy girl. I mean, I don't know what to tell you, but you know, <laughs> after a while, there's no sense in hiding it. It's so obvious. You know, he was my boss when I was at Bravo and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I really loved working there and I'd like to think I had some part in building the network and, you know, I was sort of pre the housewives stuff, but I was happy to do it. And I, I got two Emmys for my show there and I'm really proud of the specials I did there. And, you know, it's great. And so I worked at other networks and other companies. And so I did, it didn't have to be like that. And so um, in my opinion, Andy Cohen like sort of wanted to be me. Like he was a publicist mm. when I met him. And then all of a sudden he was doing stuff on bravotv.com, like red carpet stuff, like he's Joan Rivers or something. And then he gave himself a talk show that he picks up every year, which has never happened in the history of television where the executive gives himself a talk show. And, you know, now he's doing New Year's Eve with Anderson Cooper. And so it's kind which of Which you used about. to do. Which you used to do. I did for 10 years, you know, and it was a job I really loved. And, you know, so it's all out there. So um, when, when I had years of thinking, like, is it is he kind of coming after me? It feels like he is, you know, and now it's out there. And and that's an unfortunate thing. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, it I just kind of learned there's not really a point in being quiet about it. So I was able to include a tape of him, ironically, talking to TMZ. And that really lays it out. So when I got to put it in Kathy Griffin to help a story, um, mm -hmm. then there it is, you know, and there he is being who he really is. And, you know, you learn stuff like that about people. And 
obviously my my Trump photo scandal has has taught me a lot about the people around me and the people not around me and stuff. But it's, you know, I, I have to admit, I, I feel kind of good when people hit me up on Twitter or something and say I'm sort of getting validated. And I'm not sure that the way to make a statement is the way I, I always do it. But I, I really applaud you guys not being afraid to shine the light on stuff. And you can do it with humor and you can do it all kinds of ways. But, you know, in this time when everything's blurry and people don't know what to believe and people are on, online believing um, that I'm in a basement eating babies with Tom Hanks and Hillary Clinton, <laughs> then somebody has to stand up and go, no, you know, I don't care if it costs me this endorsement or, you know, if this audience is, is uncomfortable with me for a mm -hmm. while, eventually, you know, the truth comes out if we keep speaking about it. And if you can do it with humor, in my case, then that's the best case scenario. Looking at the whole journey, you know, being blacklisted and not being able to work at these jobs anymore, and going fully independent, do you feel like it was worth it when it's all said and done? I do. And I would, probably wouldn't have said that when I was 29 or 39 or 49. But at 59, you know, I'm really interested in money and financial things. And I, I really take pride in like um, saving my money and being like a, a conservative investor and stuff like that. So it's something that luckily I had an interest in my whole career. Also, my parents like were so old, they were from the depression. So I grew up with this ethic of use it up, wear it out, make it do, and, you know, take every single job, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's important for folks to remember in our business, it's show business. So don't be afraid to love that part of it. And when I meet like young comedians and stuff, and they ask me for advice, I always say, remember, you can be funny anytime, but you got to do the business part now. And you know, so I think one of the goals that's been satisfying for me, and I think for most artists, is if you get to a place where you can own your own material, um, that's very gratifying. So, for example, I spent a lot of money buying back my library from NBC Universal. So I mm. bought all six seasons of my life on the D list, all my specials, the two years of my talk show called Kathy. And, you know, I now own it. And, you know, someday maybe some streaming service will come along and say, OK, we, we'd like to make this stuff available for people. I don't know. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen at some point. And it's a nice feeling to go, OK, this is a this is a time when I want to own it. I want to have some say in where it goes. And, um, you know, whether it's a big money maker or not, it's nice to go, you know, what? all those years, those decades of work that I did and I'm still doing, that's my work. You know, yeah. why should one guy who said yes at one meeting 15 years ago get more, you know, of, of my royalties or whatever you want to call it than I do? So it's something I kind of take pride in. And I had to learn it because being blacklisted, obviously, I've had a lot of time to think and work with the lawyers about stuff like that, about buying my library and make a film myself and release it. And now it's on Amazon and Apple and you can get it wherever films are seen. And, you know, it's different for me. It's a political comedic film. It's like half comedy special, half documentary. And some of the stuff in there is pretty raw and it deals with the fallout from the Trump photo and stuff. But hopefully it makes people laugh as well. See, one of the things that I was disappointed, though, is when you apologize during the whole situation, because the thing I love about you and I've always loved about you, whether it's stand up or you doing an appearance on a show or co-hosting somewhere or even on New Year's Eve, is just you're raw, you're fearless, you say what you mean, your advocacy for the LGBT community. I'm 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 I'm, I'm offended at not seeing them be more publicly supportive of you, knowing that Trump doesn't care about the gays and the fact that you were always out there. Uh, you know, leading the charge. Um, and so I didn't, I was a little disappointed that you apologized. Was that, was that more of a PR thing that your team was telling you to do? Or did you feel, or was things crashing around you where you wanted to just do damage control? You know, it was both because the level of the wall of crap that fell on me was so massive, you know, and I've dealt with like bad press, like who doesn't, or you get a bad review or something like that. And that's part of the, that's, you know, part of doing business and you, you pull up your, your big girl pants and that's all there is to it. But this, you know, knowing, I, I think when, when the um, feds opened an investigation and I learned I was going to be investigated wow. for the crime and they were seriously considering charging me with conspiracy to assassinate the president of the United States which holds a lifetime sentence. So, you know, I was investigated by the Secret Service and the U.S. Attorney's Office. So the Secret Service was going to see if they could find any intent and then hand it over to the U.S. The AUSA, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office to see if they would mm -hmm. file charges. You know, that's just another level. You know, I mean, like you said, I've, I've had the ladies on The View talk smack about me or any other blog or even newspapers and stuff like that. But when it gets to a point where you think, oh my gosh, are people going to believe this about me? And then you have 
federal agencies involved, which, by the way, has never happened in the history of this country. Never in the history of this country has a private citizen, much less a comedian, been investigated for that um, when, you know, when they did not show any real intent. So I can go into the whole reasons that they weren't able to charge me because it's like obvious. But let me tell you, I had to go through an actual month long real investigation. And so I think when that came down, it got more real in a way that I wasn't able to grasp yet. So yeah, unfortunately, I kind of gave in to the PR folks around me, the lawyers around me. And they were at that point, they were thinking, you know, we want you to work again, and we want you to stay out of prison. And at that moment, you know, I also had a lot of people from the veteran community. And I've done a lot of work with veterans. I've gone to Afghanistan, I've gone to Iraq, I've performed in war zones. Um, and so hearing from those folks that when they saw that photo, it had already been manipulated into, get ready, thinking that I was a member of ISIS. Wow. Yeah, it got so crazy. What? So rapidly. Yeah, they, my photo was like in Arab countries 12 hours later. And so there was a global campaign to convince people that I was an active member of ISIS. Because, you know, they're recruiting a lot of 59-year-old redhead comedians. That's their <laughs> demo. And, you know, I wasn't aware of that campaign yet. I didn't know about the Brad Parscales and the Stephen Millers. I didn't know how hands-on Jeff Sessions was and all those folks. I couldn't even conceive of an environment where some crazy edict would come from the Oval to cabinet members who would then do stuff about it, you know. And um, so before I sort of was able to unravel the source of all that, where that stuff was coming from. And TMZ did play a part in that. I mean, they were, I believe they were the first ones to post the picture. And, yeah, and know, I remember in your, in your video, you were talking about, which I'm sure you dive into deeper in a hell of a story that like, they were literally reporting every single thing that was happening to you as a result of posting that photo. Yeah. I was in the middle of a 50 city tour. I was 25 cities through doing my thing. I love touring. And, um, you know, I got news of the first cancellation, I think a couple hours after the photo went live, then it was on the CNN ticker that I had been fired and they made an ISIS connection, which was very bizarre. There were like discussion shows about me where they put like the four boxes up and there's the conservative person. And then there's the religious person. And then, the, you know, and everybody was saying that, how could I do this? You know, and People were actually considering the notion that I would be promoting terrorism or ISIS. And even, I mean, not to have their backs, but even they probably didn't know it was part of this campaign, which had already been set up to, you know, be, be uh, something that was easy for the president's team to enact. And also Bob Mueller had just been appointed. So they were very nervous about that. And I was the nice, bright, shiny object to distract. So, you know, knowing what I know now, I rescind that apology. I take it back. I felt bad for like 48 hours. And then finally I went, wait a minute, this is BS. This shouldn't be happening to other people. And I sort of started my my mission to try to, you know, expose what, what really happened with that whole thing. Were you mad at the ladies at The View for not giving you an opportunity to share your perspective? Because I felt like they were really hard on you. Yes. Yes. I'm mad at all of them. I mean, all of them. <laughs> never have done that. I mean, first of all, they all know me personally. But second of all, like you said, already at this point, the stuff Trump had, Trump had done very much warranted myself and every comedian going after him, all the groups that he certainly targeted, the people of color, women, you know, I mean, the, the things that he had done even at that point were so frightening and egregious that I wish that everyone had looked at my mm -hmm. situation and thought there, but for the grace of God, go I, because guess what? I was kind of the warm up act and he did go on to do it to several other people. And, you know, now you have a situation where people just kind of are used to him having members of the FBI investigated because they're investigating him. You know, they don't quite understand whatever he says, he accuses whatever he accuses someone else of doing is something he himself is doing. So, you know, I, I do get frustrated with folks that didn't see it. And now I'm wrapped up in all this QAnon stuff. And there's all this oh. whole online movement where they think I'm on a Jeffrey Epstein flight log. Like I knew that guy, like, come on. And so, yeah, it's disheartening when people want to do But the, the crazy thing. part is that they're not talking about the fact that Trump was his friend. And that's that I really- You're talking really, about it now. I've yeah. seen a lot of ads going out. <laughs> Yeah, but, 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 but Trump is videotaped with him dancing at a party where mm -hmm. minors are present who actually came forward and said, yes, I was a victim. So yeah. 
it, it's, you know, I'm actually wondering, like, you know how the 2016 thing was the whole Hillary, like crooked Hillary, but her emails. I'm wondering if the 2020 plan is to convince enough people that somehow Donald Trump, and this is crazy, Donald Trump is saving the world from child trafficking. <laughs> no, and, and and that's the message that's out there. That's the yeah. message. And even listening to like again, going back to Lazy the View, Joy Behar just yesterday told Michael Cohen, you should have slapped the shit out of Trump. It's like, wait a minute, you just told him he should have punched the president, but yet you guys were condemning somebody for a joke. I, I really feel it's like I live confusing. in the twilight zone, Kathy, especially coming out of the Obama administration. So I'm just I I I wanted to talk to you because I know the times that we live in right now. We need humor. There's yeah. not a lot of people that can deliver humor the way that you do um, and say it in a way that is is informative and educational, but also just extremely hilarious. I wish Joan Rivers was still alive. She was somebody oh. that I think she would be on a no flight list right now or a, a no <laughs> Do, well, your relationship you with her no was flight. special, right? Oh yeah, I, I just, I you know, I just, you know, she passed away six years ago, and I loved her so much, and she was, she was such an important person uh, in the world and in my life. I loved her as a friend. I loved her as a mentor. We talked shop all the time. Like, sure, we talked about life, you know, but we would talk about what it was like to be a woman in the business and all the other comics that helped her along the way, and. Um, you know, she was so generous with her advice and commiserating, and she would also be vulnerable, you know, things that made her, uh, made her question herself maybe, or maybe she'd go get a little more plastic surgery than originally planned and, you know, things like that. And it was very clear to me that that was kind of part of her journey was dealing with the years and years of people not understanding that she didn't, you know, she went and did her Fox late night talk show because Johnny Carson didn't want her to you know, succeed him. Mm -hmm. And people will still say, oh, she, she should have betrayed Johnny Carson. And I'm a Johnny Carson fan. She didn't betray Johnny Carson. They weren't even considering her. So she got another offer and she did what any guy would have done, which is said, I'll take it. And then, you know, it's kind of like they, she was tough because, um, you know, she, she had a difficult road her whole life, even with all of her success. And I saw it personally. And I also saw her have so much joy. And sometimes like, you know, the online stuff wasn't as bad as it is now, but she had such a great sense of humor. And I remember one time she went for Rihanna and all the, the Rihanna army was going for her so hard. And I met up with her one night in Vegas. She had a show at one casino and I had a show at another casino. And sometimes we would get dinner afterwards, you know, and just sort of gossip. And I just, I was almost nervous to bring it up because some of the stuff online was like rough, like really rough and the memes and all that. And I was like, so how are you doing with the whole like Rihanna army thing? And she was eating her pasta and she goes, isn't it fabulous? And I just loved that. I admired that. She just thought, hey, people are talking about me. It's going to blow over. And she was right, you know, and uh, that's one of the things that I, I learned from her and I try to practice, but also so important. And no matter how old she got, and this is what I loved is just admiring her going to 80 years old, balls to the wall. Like you said, never apologizing, standing by her stuff. And, you know, there's a reason we miss her and we miss the greats yeah. like that. And whatever their issues, you know, I mean, there's a lot of the greats that have had addiction issues and personal issues and that's great. But like many industries in, in the arts, you got to kind of put that stuff to the side because when it comes to the work and in times like this, I, I hear that all the time. And I, I'm, I love when people say that I, Oh, what would Joan say? What would this person say? And I think, I love that you guys are open to this because I'm fearful that we're now permanently in this era where people want everything to be safe because they're so freaking well, and, and it can't, and it can't be. Can and I, and I, and I think about even Joan on Fashion Police and you going into that space. And when you left, it just failed. Like nobody wants to hear this fluffy shit all day long that publicists are pumping out. Like I don't even talk to publicists. So I'm yeah. very rare where people, publicists will pitch us all the time. And I'm like, listen, if I don't feel a connection or like the person, I don't want to talk to them. And I feel like in Fashion Police where you all were creating conversations that the viewers at home were saying about the shit people were wearing on the carpets. Mm -hmm. Like we, we just missed that, that realness. Do you ever think we'll get it back? You know, I think we're going to have to work at it, you know? Um, and by the way, I think my publicist is Tiffany Haddish because she's the one who set this up. So she's the one publicist that I really like. Oh, she, um, she loves you so much. Listen, we, I don't I, know what we, I don't know what we were talking about, but we definitely got off of that and started talking about you. And uh, yeah, so she's <laughs> definitely doing a great job. And she's so talented and she's got a great business mind as well. So I, I just love her. And she's also not afraid to tell it like it is. And, you know, I think that I think we're going to get back there, but I just think people have to really 
stay vigilant about like everything. But I agree with you. I think that we're not really in a, in a period right now where people want to hear the fluffy stuff. I agree. Like I admit a lot of the stuff that used to hold my attention, like in the celebrity gossip world, I kind of am bored with it now because there's so much real stuff going on and we do need humor. We need humor to get through it. And I feel like we're in an era where the only kind of humor that's going to kind of work for me is if you're going for the stuff and you're not BSing. And I think that's why Sarah Cooper does well, because when she just lip syncs Trump, he's providing, frankly, the shock value. And so you just sort of watch her facial expressions and stuff like that. And it's funny, but there's a reason she's really hitting now. And I think it's because people don't quite know what to know what to do with this environment. It's really a frightening time. Like I said, I'm 59 years old. I've never lived through anything like this. So, you know, we have to figure out a way to laugh about this stuff, but also we can't shy away from the stuff that's real because we're all being slapped in the face with it, if you will. And um, I, I think, I think you'll find that people are going to start to move away from so much fluff. And there is a hunger for somebody to kind of to tell it like it is. I know I like that. Uh, you know, you were talking about Joan Rivers. You brought up Tiffany Haddish. It seemed like everybody turned their back on you when this went down, right? But who was there for you? Who stood by you and helped you through, if any? You know, it's it, it was a tough thing. I, 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 got a, um, I got a great call from uh, Cat Williams that day. Okay. And he picked, he, I picked up the phone and it was him. And, um, he, uh, he said that he was with some friends and he was on speaker and he goes, they did this to a white lady. So already I was laughing. And, um, and, uh, he said this thing to me, which was really true. He said, get out a pen and paper. And I'm like, Oh God. Okay, here we go. And he goes, um, write down the number of people that are going to call you today and say they're behind you hundred percent. And at the end of the day, you're going to, you're going to see how many friends you have. And I always thought of that because there were three names. <laughs> and, um, you know, certainly in, in the first couple of days, it was just too frightening for everybody. Um, I mean, you know, um, it was nice when people sort of tracked me down, like Jim Carrey tracked me down, which was really wow. nice. I don't really know him. I don't have his phone number or anything. I've met him a couple of times. And um, he was really... Yeah, I was I was like a hysterical mess. I'm not going to lie. I was crying. Like I said, the lawyers were calling. It was, you know, uh, my agents were freaked out because they had to get security at their agency. They were getting death threats themselves. I later found out those death threats were robocalls. They weren't even people. It was like a computerized thing because I'm like on the algorithm, you know. And, um, you know, so it was nice when Jim Carrey reached out and he said, um, he said, you know, uh, he, he said this thing to me I'll never forget. He said, take your time and process this. He said, you can, you know, really just, this is a significant thing. And he said, but when the time is right, put it through your Kathy Griffin comedy prism and make it funny. And I was sobbing as, oh, Jim, my life is over. And he said, every comedian I know would give their right arm to have this happen to them. Wow. And whether or not that's true, it meant so much that he said that, you know. So I thought it was interesting that he reached out, you know, because he's he's a guy that like it, things are going so well that it's not going to it's not going to taint him. I think there's a lot of celebrities that frankly thought, oh, if I'm associated with Kathy Griffin, then mm. people will think I'm this or that or I don't know. <laughs> and I says, I can't I still can't get over that one. So, um, you know, it's it was definitely a, a sobering thing. And um, if nothing else. I was really glad to get on the road fairly quickly and I was smart enough to play overseas and boy, did I do well. I have to say I've never played the cities and countries and the venues that I played. I played something like 17 countries overseas. I got to play gorgeous, huge venues. They thought the whole thing was hilarious and outrageous. And, you know, I know that Fox News tries to act like we're America number one, but guess what? There's a whole world out there and they know he's crazy and they know it's dead. And so um, by the time I came back to the States, I finally was able to um, take more control of my touring business, which I really liked. And uh, I don't think the boys over at Live Nation or AEG liked it, but I knew that I had to be really specific about where I went. I knew that I wasn't physically safe in some environments. So it was nice to take more control of the touring business. And I got to do just amazing venues. I got to play Radio City Music Hall for the first time. I sold out Carnegie Hall in 12 hours. Like, so for all the sort of press folks saying, oh, she's over and done with, I was like, I don't know, in my real life, things are going pretty well. So I, I certainly look forward to whenever what happens with COVID, getting back on the road, because there's nothing like it. That's so cool. in, in a hell of a story, do you cover all the women who abandoned you? Because in that clip on YouTube, it was interesting to hear how many women who were in positions of power 
who could have had your back or at least created a safe place for you. And when I think about cancel culture, that all started around the Me Too movement. And then now here we are, they're canceling you and they're, here, they're all abandoning you and you're calling out names. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, it sucks. And, you know, um, I, I do expect more from women because they know the struggle and they know the deal. And certainly, like I said, women of a certain age. So uh, it's, you know, it's definitely put a strain on certain friendships and certain friendships maybe don't exist anymore. And um, I just, for me, I had to learn, like, I can't live with those folks around me. And I'm not sure who I'm sort of dancing for anymore, but it can't be folks that I now know in the face of something so obviously ridiculous. And so obviously something you would not want to happen to you or a loved one, you know, that um, it, it definitely has not been a fun thing to learn that people can be not scared off so easily because that's kind of, I kind of don't blame some, some folks for that, but the people can kind of still stick to their, still stick to their guns about that. You know, I mean, I, I had women in the industry, you know, to this, well, to this day that feel like I got myself into a bad situation and I'm like, well, I'm not really in a bad situation. I'm kind of doing winning. Okay. And, <laughs> you know, and also really after all this time. So, um, you know, it's, as, as more time passes, it's definitely interesting to see who sort of comes back and goes, hey, I didn't quite get it. And a, a lot of folks have, by the way. A lot of folks either saw my film or saw something where they kind of heard a different side of it. Um, and uh, I just, I definitely have my spidey sense out for anybody that is still like coming at me. So I wouldn't, I, I think it's okay after all the crap I've been through to not willingly put myself in a situation where I feel like, you know, like, I don't know if I would go on The View now, frankly. Like, you think I care about Meghan McCain's shit? You know what I mean? Like, I need her coming at me. I, I, I text people at the show all the time. Why is she still there? It's like. I get it. Like, I guess it, it's I guess it, it's a viral moment if she says something particular. Bring Elizabeth back. I will take Elizabeth back at this point. That's a low bar. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, you know, as long as I was doing that show and, and I, I think I co-hosted something like 20 times one year or something like that. Cause they were always like considering me for the show and am I too controversial and all that other stuff. Um, you know, it's, it, they've always wanted a conservative voice and I just feel like the word conservative has a whole new meaning, you know, um, yeah. and the Republican party isn't the Republican party anymore. And I'm a lifelong Democrat. And I also want Democrats to be proud to be freaking Democrats. I'm tired of this. Like the other team is convincing us we should be ashamed of what of social programs of democracy which we may not have in six months of elections that run fairly smoothly you know so it's it's frustrating to be trying to beat that drum which really just feels like nonpartisan common sense and then have to deal with the Meghan McCain's of the world well what do you think about Kanye West I mean his birthday party he may run and win he may become the president would you support that I would not support it I um I very <laughs> I believe it or not I uh here, here by the way here's Here's the thing. I, uh, and you know, they live next door to me for like a couple of years. So I, I live in, in, um, scenic, the main streets of Bel Air, California. And it was very fun living next door to them. For, seriously. It was like, there was always something going on. And, you know, whenever I would go over there, he's not a big talker. I'm not gonna lie. He's not a big talker. Um, I did see him Christmas Eve. They're nice enough to invite me over on, on Christmas Eve, which is very nice. And I get along with the wife. And uh, she can buy, by the way, she can buy and sell me and him like a hundred times over. She's got those spanks. She's got the makeup, she's got the ass, you know, none of the stuff I thought of. I'm so pissed. Anyway, um, you know, one, one time I saw her, saw her down at the driveway and um, I was, you know, I love to tease her because it's fun. And I go, uh, it was, it was right after uh, Kanye had gone to Trump Tower that first time. You know, I think it was. And, 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 took, the, and took the picture. Took the picture. And so she, uh, they ha they used to have the, the mom who is, you know, the ultimate. The mom is actually burning money. That's what the California fire is. <laughs> it's, not money. it's out of control. There's too many. Um, and so the mom bought them, I'm not even kidding, a Rolls Royce golf cart to drive around like the neighborhood. <laughs> right? Or they had two kids at the time. And so I see Kim uh, with the, the daughter, North, and she's got like this ridiculous Rolls Royce golf cart. Which, oh, by the way, this is really fun. Another time, uh, my husband and I were going on like this walk around the neighborhood. And another time we saw like about halfway through like our sort of little loop, we saw that uh, Kanye with a, a tow truck because the golf cart had had some sort of mechanical issues. And there's Kanye West. Beep, beep. <laughs> and I just walked by him. I go like this. <laughs> We've arrived. Uh, never laughs at my jokes, but the wife does. So I love her.
Anyway, so I just I just saw the wife and I just teased her and I go, what the hell? Stop sending your husband to Trump Tower. All right. That, you know, Trump's crazy. And I she just goes like this. Uh, he wasn't in his right mind that day. And I go, you know that? <laughs> I go, I knew that. We all know it. I didn't know you knew it. And she's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, so, oh, yeah. So I'm easy. You laugh at my jokes and you, you own me for life. But um, I will say when Kanye said to David Letterman on David's Netflix show that he's never voted, you know, that's a problem for me. You know, I, I like a candidate that's, you know, voted. And the fact that I don't think he's necessarily aware that some of his funding and operatives are coming from the Trump campaign. He thinks Jared Kushner is the greatest broker of Middle East peace. Maybe not accurate. Um, so, look, I love him as an artist. Uh, I love that the wife admits that sometimes he is not in the right mind. And by the way, he, so is he. He's told him. Um, however, I have a Grammy for Best Comedy Album, which, by the way, those are hard to win. I will not be pissing on it. I will not be pissing on it, not pooping on it. I, you know, I polish it once a week. And by the way, you know where it is? It's right when you walk in the door. You walk in the door. My, it's like you get hit in the face with my two Emmys and Grammy because I want you to know. But you, but you, when you've earned them, though. I mean, if people really just look at your IMDb, you've done so much great television and entertainment, and and I kind of feel like you know I, I'm I'm glad to talk to you because I I love the fact that you're still standing. Like we know you got scraped up, and it was the craziest thing. I mean, the people that I saw talking against it was which surprised me, and I wasn't even yeah. in it. All right, y'all, it's time for another Hollywood hookup. Now, I don't know if y'all knew, but September is National Life Insurance Awareness Month. But with everything going on right now, a lot of people aren't even aware if it's possible to get life insurance at all. And we all need it right now, too. We all need it, and I have the solution, and the solution is called Policy Genius. Now, I know you're probably asking, what is Policy Genius? I was just about to ask you, what is that? Well, Jason, it's an insurance marketplace Built and backed by a team of industry experts, and I'm going to break down how it works. Here's step one. You go to policygenius.com. In minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need and compare your quotes from the top insurers to find your best price. Step two, apply for the lowest price. Guess what? There's a step three. The Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and red tape. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance company. So if you hit any speed bumps, during the application process, they'll take care of everything. And I mean it. They even have policies which allow eligible customers to skip the in-person medical exam and do it over the phone, which is oh, so convenient. That's convenient. You ain't got to leave the house. Especially right now with this COVID going on. So that kind of service has earned Policy Genius a five-star rating across 1,600 reviews on Trustpilot and Google. So this is how you get it done, all right? If you need life insurance, head to policygenius.com right now to get started. You can save $1,500 or more a year by comparing quotes by their marketplace. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. And that's your Hollywood hookup. That was genius. Now, I want to ask you, what do you think about Ellen DeGeneres and everybody trying to cancel Ellen? Well, I just don't like her because, I mean, my own experience with her is she's just not a nice person. But mm. and I don't think she writes her own material. I don't know. But I think that's like a big no-no if you're a comic. Like, at least her specials, I don't think she writes them, which is, I don't know. Um, but, you know, this is this is a woman who's really, uh, like, here's the thing. She shouldn't be canceled because I think she might be wrapped up in the QAnon stuff. So if there are people that want to cancel her because they think that she's in a pedophile ring with Steven Spielberg, <laughs> then uncancel. However, she's not exactly warm. I mean, she's like a, a brick of ice with some blonde hair. But, you know, she does her thing and she's right down the middle and she's got a million endorsements and she's mm. flipping the houses with the wife who's, you know, got a lot of horses because wouldn't she want some horse therapy? I'm just saying. And I say this with love. Um, and so she's not a fan of mine. And uh, Wait, you know, why, why doesn't she like you? Huh? Why doesn't she like you? She thinks I'm mean. <laughs> you know, I have my day. Wait, why, how how are you caught up in the irony of a king who is ruining the world, but you're the bad guy, and a talk show host comedian who everybody's saying is mean, but you're the mean person? How, Kathy? 
you know, I just, I, I, we live in an upside down world Two and I, I try to call it out when I can. And, you know, every so often I get the balls to say this stuff publicly. And, you know, I will say out of this whole sort of scandal that I've now, I've now become the scandalous comic, it does make me more fearless. And I do realize now that I've tussled with the likes of Donald Trump and Ellen, at the end of the day, you know, I'm fine. And what? guess what? So are they. Donald Trump's alive. He still has his head attached. <laughs> and all is fine. She's, you know, she's counting what's left over of Chris Jenner's money, which is a lot, and flipping houses. Everybody's, everyone I've always made fun of is just fine. And that's what, what I want people to remember. Kathy, why don't you go to Jeff Bezos in a dark room with a cigarette and say, look, we both have a common interest here to make this money and we don't like the Cheeto in charge. Amazon is doing great over there. I, I am now into Amazon content. I want to see a stand up. Kathy Griffin scandal. I love it. I don't know anyone there, but I love it. I love your approach. I I don't think I can DM him. I don't think he follows me on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> but someday I I would love. Trust me, I would love any sort of a deal with a streaming service or a network oh. just as an fu to the Trumps. I mean, that I, I, I think it would be. I think it would be a juggernaut. I think people want it right now. It's the perfect time. And I also and also with the streaming services, you have to think about all of the other countries besides this one who hates them. And this country now hates them. So it's perfect. I mean, what better marketing would they have? They wouldn't even need to market it. As soon as they put out an announcement, it's going to be everywhere. No, I, I really appreciate that because my my little, I call it my little movie that could, Kathy Griffin to help the story. It's actually showing in 60 countries on mm -hmm. Amazon. So I'm thrilled. And there is there is a real market to hear some no BS in this country and certainly overseas. So I agree. Next time I run into Bezos at the Billionaire Club, I will tell him you said hi, and then I will be being taken out by security. What would be the ideal play? Because to me, I don't see you going back to be somebody's employee anymore. I feel like you're well past that. What would be the ideal play? Well, you know, it's interesting with COVID. I don't know about sort of getting back to a television show. I know some people are going back to work, but it's very uncharted territory. What I could do is I could do a special tomorrow. So I never run out of material. I, I'm actually in the Guinness Book of World Records. I've written and, and produced uh, more stand-up televised specials than any comedian in history, male or female. Wow. So I certainly always have material and I, and I have stories to tell and I'm not afraid to tell them as you know. So my next thing would, I would love to do a special and I could produce it myself and hope to get distribution. And, you know, hey, that's a gamble, but I might do it. So it'd be nice if someone stepped up to the plate with money. But in the meantime, I at some point, I'll definitely have to let all this stuff out. Oh, listen, I'm going to be right here to eat it up. Uh, you're one of my favorites. I, I love this conversation. The time just flew by. I um, I hope that somebody somewhere gets this special. Pay for it. Some, I mean, we know enough people with money. Floyd, pay for it. Um, <laughs> No, I really, I really am glad that you're still standing and um, damaged. Go watch just right now on YouTube that 17 minute read. It was so filthy. It was so great. Um, okay, what else is going on? You don't have a book coming out yet. No, I, I'm still just my latest project. There you go. Hell of a story. Yeah, hell of a story. Feature film. Also has lots of comedy in it. So I would just say check that out. See if you like it, and then you know we'll see what's next. Well, listen, anytime we need to do anything to help, just please let us know. We appreciate you taking the time with us. I'm a friend of the show. I'll be back. Yes. No, for please. sure. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to go to The View anymore. So fuck it. Come over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys were not at all like Megan McCain. So thank you. No. Th that, now that was a compliment. Thank you. All right. <laughs> bye, Kathy. Bye. Bye.